Thank you, Faraz. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Rama Malik, and today I'll be talking about the MFA Illustration Practice Program at the Maryland Institute College of Art, or MICA. So pre-Fulbright, not an art school in sight. So from 2012 to 2016, I was actually a student at LUMS. I graduated with a BA honors in English and a minor in political science. When I started my LUMS journey, I was very convinced that I was going to be a political science student. And then midway through, they introduced the English degree. And I had always been interested in English literature. And so I just switched because, yeah, I realized political science wasn't going to be for me. Um, from 2016 to 2018, I was working at The Last Word, which is an independently, independent bookstore in Lahore. And then from 2018 to 2020, I attended MICA and I graduated in a pandemic, which was very fun and not at all stressful. Um, and here is the beautiful MICA building. This is the, where the graduate school programs are held. So when I was at LUMS, a thing that I would do in a lot of my English courses was talk about comics because that's something that I had loved ever since I was a kid. Um, so wherever I could, I was talking about you know, just writing essays on it and just cramming it in <laughs> wherever and whenever I could. So for my S project, LAMS, I actually adapted a chapter of Dastani Amir Hamza into a comic, as you can see over here. So this was my senior project at LAMS. So this is just kind of to give you a sense that even though I was doing a liberal arts degree, I was very much including visual arts into it. And I was very lucky that I was um, surrounded by professors and my thesis advisor actually let me do this instead of writing a 10,000 word essay on Amir Hamza instead. So these are just some interior shots. At this point, I didn't really know much about art because I hadn't studied it in A-levels. I had kind of stopped after O-levels, but I was always very interested in just making things and doodling and things like that. So these are just some interior shots from my s uh, When I was working at The Last Word, I was kind of responsible for everything. Like I would write book reviews, I would, edit things on the website. I was responsible for the entirety of the Instagram feed. So I developed like the visual language that now the new employees there kind of use. Um, because when I left, I made this very handy booklet being like, this is how you design posts to sell books. So I would always notice that uh, posts that would have a person in them would always do better. So I started drawing myself in scenarios uh, based off of the books. I was really interested in speculative fiction. I still am. So I would kind of focus my reviews on those and the graphic novels that we had in stock. And this is just, again, to show you the kinds of posts that I would do. So again, I'm kind of combining photography with illustration, um, with props, with Photoshop. A lot of these backgrounds didn't exist, or I would add the color. I would do a lot of photo editing. And it was just fun. I would make gifts to post online. Um, and it was just a great, like I was working on the fly and kind of just learning on the job, which really came in handy later on. Um, I also designed the store's wrapping paper. I was very lucky to have been given this opportunity. Um, it's still available. So if you ever get your gift uh, book, uh, like gift wrap from there, um, you will be using my work, which is always exciting to see. So I was at the same time, I was also doing a lot of personal work, again, based on fantasy, based on speculative fiction. Um, this is a book I made as my sister's wedding present because she loves folktales from East Asia. And so I kind of just made these sorts of things, <laughs> these illustrations. I found Chinese folktales, I compiled them and I just gave it to her as a, as a wedding present. So what I'm trying to show you is that even though I had this degree that's basically about essay writing and analyzing other people's literary work. I was kind of always interested in visual arts and I was always working in some capacity with that, uh, with that as a field anyway, um, despite having not pursued it fully. So when it came time, so I'd been working at The Last Word for about a year at that point and it was time to think about my next steps. And so I decided that I wanted to go um, and apply for an illustration program with a creative writing component. At the time, the Salam Award for uh, Speculative Fiction had just been introduced um, and I was heading a writer circle at The Last Word. So twice a month, aspiring speculative fiction writers would meet and I would basically, we would do warm up exercises, we would critique each other's work. Um, I, I really felt passionate passionately about this kind of genre fiction and I really wanted that um, there was a space for it at least at the last word at the time there wasn't a very robust publishing industry in Pakistan so I was aware of that and I was like okay but how can I try to just you know overcome these things locally and what is how can I contribute to kind of building that um, sphere here 
Um, and it was similar for um, visuals and for books, because at the time, again, especially for speculative fiction or graphic novels or children's books, there weren't that many that were being published in Pakistan for Pakistanis. I'm glad to say that's beginning to change now. Um, but at the time, it was really like, you know, parents would come to the last word and they would be like, oh, can we take back stuff for our kids? Because they would come for winter vacation and they're like, our kids know nothing about their culture. Do you have anything? And I'm like, I have a book on Indian children because that's the closest that I can I can get for you. And so noticing all of this, I kind of want realized that I wanted to be one of the people who would just do it and who would create those stories, who would illustrate those stories and who would put them out into the world. Um, and so when I was writing my personal statement and my study objectives, I made it very clear that again, even though I didn't have an undergraduate degree in art, I was very passionate about pursuing this. So I talked about how representation matters and how my experiences at the bookstore and generally as a reader, you know, I, I wasn't really um, after the certain kind of Desi authors that we're used to. After a while, I just wanted to read something that was very fun and very exciting and maybe not relying on the tropes that we had seen so far and things like that. Um, and so I, I highlighted the writer circle. I highlighted the fact that sometimes I would give them uh, prompts that were illustration based and be like, okay, write a short story based on this illustration. And that would be a fun warm up exercise that I would also take part in. Um, I also highlighted on ground initiatives in Pakistan, um, like the Bright Star Mobile Library, so it, which is a traveling library and they go to government schools or to schools with underprivileged children and it's a little bus that has a lot of books in it and it's lovely and volunteers go and read to the kids and it's like an hour that they get um, as, as exposure to different kinds of cultures and things. And I also really made it clear at the time, I didn't exactly know which schools I wanted to apply to, but I need, but I did have some names in mind. And so when I went to their websites, you know, any big artist is usually listed if they've been a guest critic or a visiting faculty or a full-time faculty. And so I highlighted those people who I knew could then be corroborated off of the school's websites. And I said, you know, these are the people that I would be interested in working with and learning from. And it kind of set me apart, I think, in that it didn't just show that I was just randomly saying it. It was like, no, I've done the research to the extent that I know the kinds of people who teach at these schools. And I know what I want to learn from them and why that's important for me and for what I want to do when I come back. So this is the kind of way that I kind of framed my personal statement and my study objectives at the time. So when I came to MICA, so the illustration practice program is actually really interesting in how it's structured. So it's spearheaded by Kimberly Ellen Hall, who is over here on the right with the red hair, and Whitney Sherman on the left, who is the program head. She designed the whole thing from scratch. She handles the thesis projects of the second years, and Kim handles all of the first year work. Um, both years have two days of compulsory studio time, so from uh, on Mondays and Thursdays, nine to three. If you're first year, you are definitely expected to be in the studio because you're doing assignments and things. Um, in second year, it's a bit more flexible because you get to show up whenever you think it's appropriate for your thesis. So all of Micah's graduate programs are pass fail, which is incredibly important um, and which really took the edge off for me because when I came in, I was very aware of the fact that I didn't have a formal arts background, um, that when I was putting together my portfolio, some of the schools, you know, they had asked for things like figure drawing and things like that, uh, like technical drawing and uh, drawing skills that I really struggled with when putting together my portfolio because I hadn't attended drawing classes and things like that after O levels. So by having a pass fail and not having to worry about letter grades, you know, you really have to work very hard to fail a course. That would mean you don't show up to any class, you don't do any assignments. So since it's kind of guaranteed that you're going to get to the next step, um, it just allows you to be much more experimental and free with the kind of work that you're producing. My cohort pictured here was mostly international. We were 16 students and we there were only four domestic students, me and my friend Priyanka, she's from India. So we were the only two South Asians and everyone else was Chinese and we had one Filipino, Danny. So it was, and everyone in the picture here, they were all, we're all at different points in our art careers, um, which was actually really lovely. So some people had just graduated from undergrad and had just joined the master's degree with zero work experience. Some people had already had a career of like five, six years and they were 
massively well-known artists in China and now they had decided to do this master's degree. Um, at the start of the year we were we did presentations on the work that we had done so far just to introduce ourselves to the cohort and so you know sometimes seeing my <laughs> classmates projects I was just like whoa they're so professional already like what could they possibly have to gain from this degree <laughs> like they're already there. Um, but it was great because it made for a wonderful mixture of skills. And so I knew that someone has a background in animation, so I could go and ask her for help. I knew that someone was excellent at drawing comics. And so especially during first year, because you have all of your classes together, the studio days, um, it really helped during critiques to know what kinds of thinking people can have when approaching a pro the same project, what kind of ideas they can get. And it's really fun to try, try to figure each other out as well that, oh yeah, it makes sense that you would do this. So it was a great learning opportunity from each other as well. Um, so the structure of the first year is that it's workshop-based teaching. A guest, guest artist comes in and they're kind of an expert in their chosen medium. And so they come, they do a workshop for the whole of the studio day, usually Mondays. Um, so they'll come, they'll teach you, and then you are expected to do what is called a reaction piece, which is essentially an assignment um, in that same medium. So if one week you were taught ceramics, then you were expected to produce a ceramics piece after. So when I was looking at other schools, so I applied to the School of Visual Arts in New York, the Fashion Institute of Technology, FIT in New York also, um, and SCAD, the Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, MICA was actually my fourth choice. And it was something that Fulbright had given to me because I couldn't come up with a fourth option. We had a lot of back and forth of, um, you know, Fulbright kept suggesting schools. I was like, no, not this. No, I really want to just do narrative art. And so the other three programs were really rooted in that. You know, a lot of the students output was graphic novels, was comics and things. And at the time I thought this is all I want to do in my life. So SVA was actually my first choice. Um, in the end, Fulbright suggested MICA. And at that point, I think I had annoyed the people, my advisors, so much he was just like no this is it we're putting it in and I was like fine it's it's all good um I got into all of my schools but as you may be already familiar with Fulbright gets the ultimate decision deciding where you go and so they said Micah which in hindsight was a wonderful <laughs> thing that happened to me because what this did was all of these workshops it showed that the value in what you were being taught was in technical expertise it was that it was showing how much you could engage with the medium at hand. And so again, that also links back to the pass fail thing where you're not expected, if you're just being introduced to sewing or embroidery, you're not expected to make a tapestry as your assignment. But as long as you show that you're thinking critically about what can you do with this medium that's interesting and exciting, you're gonna do well in the critique. Um, so the first assignment for the program was a group exhibition called Image Harvest, which is a bit of a daunting first assignment, but it worked out really well. And so this is mandatory. Um, then, so this is my work for Image Harvest. Then the fall semester also included a trip to New York for Illustrator Week, which is um, the American Illustration Association hands out prizes to winners that, uh, who have been chosen by that year. So you go, it's this massive party. It's a great networking opportunity. Um, so that's something that's compulsory that happens in November. You're expected to kind of do transport and uh, living arrangements yourself. There's also a Christmas market held at MICA, which is the art market. So first year ILP students have to take part in it, um, which is actually, it's again daunting, but it's a wonderful way to kind of figure out how your products exist in the real world or how your illustration can exist. So some people make ceramic pieces, some people make posters, um, we'll get to what I made in a minute. Um, so it's a wonderful way to, and it's it's attended by the greater Baltimore community. So it's also a good way to kind of just engage with people. You have to set, sign up for shifts so you can be selling people. You get to talk up your classmates. It's, it's just really fun. You get to see what other schools, the undergrad uh, programs also take part. So it's a good way to also familiarize yourself with what kind of work other programs are doing. Uh, the last assignment for first year is a self-directed project that can be taken on as a kind of mini thesis or you can do whatever you want essentially. So I took it as a, I made a stop motion animation because I just wanted the time to be able to figure out if that's something I wanted to do for thesis um, or not. So the mediums we worked with included ceramics, paper cuts, stop motion, embroidery, research printing and pattern making. And students are also expected to take electives of their interest in the, they're mostly gonna be held at the undergraduate level. It can be a bit hard to get an undergrad course. So I would suggest talking to one of the professors beforehand, before course registration opens and just really make the case that 
you know, this is some, this, whatever they're teaching is something that you're so interested in, it'll help you with thesis or whatever your reasoning is for taking that course to just establish that kind of connection because often they will have to enroll you because you won't have the opportunity to register yourself because seats are limited. So this is just another example of a very collaborative project that we did with the sketch, uh, the sketchbook project with the Brooklyn Art Library. So this was the theme of my sketchbook rituals. The themes were pre-decided. We each picked one. So there were 16 sketchbooks and we each had to exchange sketchbooks with each other. And each person had to do a two page spread in someone else's book until it was full. Um, so it was a good way. It was just a, it, it was a whole semester long activity at the end of the fall. We had to submit it back. And now it's probably living at the Brooklyn Art Library, which is very exciting. Um, and so it was a great way to just kind of do things that were either very detailed, like this uh, thing that I made for my bookshelf, or something that's very bizarre, like these eyeball things that I made for someone else's sketchbook. And these are just examples of the things that people drew, that my friends drew in mind. So my theme is ritual, so this is how they each interpreted the theme. Um, so these are just some of the reaction pieces from first year. That was my ceramics project for pattern making. Um, I made this electro swing kind of robots doing 50s dances and put them, mocked them up on apparel for this. Uh, this was my poster for my Rezo zine. This is what I submitted for Art Market on the right. So I did horror movie posters inspired by those uh, from Universal movies in the 50s and 60s, but I put like Pakistani actors from the same time period. So you have Wahid Murad and Rani and there being Dracula and his wife in Baltic Port. So I had a lot of fun and this was screen printed, which is another skill that I picked up over there. Um, that was really fun and an, an exciting new medium for me. Um, this was another uh, collaborative project. I'm focusing on the, all of these just to show you the kind of scale and the, and the scope of the projects just in first year alone. So this is for the Writers in Baltimore School project. It was for an after school program for uh, local high schoolers who wrote poetry. And we were instructed to come up with visuals for their poems and it ended with a poetry recitation with our illustrations in the back as the students recited them and then there was an led billboard next to the studio building and all of our work was displayed there as well which was very exciting so when you get to second year here kind of you spend the whole of your summer vacation uh drafting a thesis proposal for Whitney's approval and she basically sits down and sees how viable your project is what if the scale is something that's achievable within like the around eight months that you have there's no restriction usually on medium or on subject past students have done like giant sculptural pieces like a fantasy land you can walk around in uh one person made a giant like i think 350 page graphic novel tracing her family's history uh another made a large scale book on this imaginary alien journey that she took and it was wonderful because she stuck beads and lace and glitter and she made a table for her thesis show. It was really exciting. Um, so my cohort was similarly diverse in the topics that we looked at. So there was a book about someone's journey through America's national parks and what they learned. Excuse me. There was a large accordion book showcasing the lives of birds in a, in a bird city where humans don't exist. So they're like doing their laundry and things like that completely uninterrupted. Um, there was also a children's book aimed at teaching kids about opossums, which was really adorable. So students sign up for guest critics. So they're visiting artists who come in the second year and you basically get to decide who you would like based on preference. And it's it should be, you should research on the artist. Obviously you're given time to do that. And you basically sign up for people who you think would be best suited to guide you. Um, on whatever it is you've chosen. So if you're doing a children's book, you know, and there's a children's book publisher, for example, for my thesis, I wouldn't choose that person. My studio partner uh, was doing a children's book, so she signed up immediately. So there's like enough diversity in who's coming that you can kind of pick out the best sort of people for yourself. Um, the guest critics sit with you for 20 minutes at your desk and you get to have like uninterrupted time with them explaining your process, what you've done so far. And it can be really fun and really helpful to just get kind of an outside perspective because sometimes you're so focused on your own work and it makes perfect sense to you. And then someone comes in, they're like, I don't understand at all what you're doing. And then you start rethinking. So it's very, very useful that way. Um, the guest critics also give lunchtime lectures, which are about 45 minutes during the lunch hour. And um, it's mandatory for all ILP students to attend. And they talk about their own practice and their own journeys as artists, um, which is always incredibly useful because they, you know, we get a lot of big names to show up as guest critics and to just know that they also struggled in the beginning or that they're still struggling, you know, sometimes they'll stand up at the podium and be like, I don't know what I'm doing next. And that's very heartening to hear as a student when you're expected to kind of have everything figured out. It's like, oh, okay, I can still, like, this is a journey that I'm on. 
Um, so the mandatory trip to New York that I mentioned becomes more important when you're in second year because you again sign up for guest critics, but this time you visit them at their studio. And it's, again, it's a great networking opportunity. You get to talk to them about future plans, um, if there's any scope for publishing, if you're doing like something that could be published. And it's just a wonderful learning opportunity. And at the party, again, it's a great uh, networking opportunity. I got to meet Yuko Shimizu, who is you know, one of my biggest inspirations for my artwork. And just to be able to walk up to her and tell her how much her work means to me was a very special moment. So once all of this is done, it usually culminates in the thesis show right after spring break. Unfortunately, mine got canceled because that's it was in March and that's when everything shut down for COVID. Um, but we adapted, we developed a website where we displayed mock-ups of our work. Some people just installed their thesis at home and did the um, kind of took the, did the documentation. And then when it came time for thesis presentations that then took place over Zoom, um, they then showed that this is what I had envisioned. This is how it would have looked like in the gallery. So everyone kind of interpreted the show in their own way at that point. And thesis presentations, like I said, took place on Zoom. You get about 20 minutes. Um, and it's like the last time you get to present, but this time from fall semester to the final product. So it's the entire year's worth of work that you have to kind of condense and again ask you can ask about next steps you can ask about um the viability of what you've made again it's just it's it's a lovely opportunity to get to be able to talk to you uh, about your work so my thesis project that i pictured here was called disquiet vignettes of anxiety this is just to give you a sense of the kinds of mediums that i worked with because it was a mixed media book so i used family photographs that's me as a kid <laughs> <laughs> um, I made a lot of patterns work. That's a picture of my mother that I scanned and then drew over. The original picture is fine. Um, this is stuff that other people, so my thesis was about two characters that represented different sides of me talking about anxiety and what it means to be an anxious artist. What uh, are the next steps that I can take um, to deal with this and things like that. I also asked uh, general people on my Instagram story what they thought about anxiety. So then I illustrated some of the statements that I received and put them in the book just to kind of act as a counterpoint of what I was feeling about my anxiety. Um, these are the backs of the two characters. This is the, near the end of the book where they're kind of um, uh, kind of disintegrating and becoming one again because the one on the left is to represent my rational side with the gold um, speech bubble and the one in blue is to represent my anxious side. And so the whole book is a conversation between these two. So the Micah experience, so when you reach any art school really from what I've heard, Fulbright will often provide additional stipend for a new laptop at the start of the semester. I was lucky because the ILP website specifically said, oh, you need a MacBook six, it, Pro 16 inch, blah, 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 like all the specifications. So I was able to send that link to my advisor and I also asked Whitney to write a special letter for me, kind of justifying the expense. So um, Fulbright granted me the money to buy a brand new machine. Uh, just to be able to handle the heavy assignments and the programs that we were going to use. So that was a lovely surprise and bonus that I got a new <laughs> new equipment out of it. Um, you can often find places to live near campus. Um, it's a 10 minute walk between the undergrad and the graduate building. So the building that I showed earlier in the presentation, that's just the graduate school. So the undergrads have two buildings across the bridge that I'll show in a minute. Um, the library, the Micah Library is absolutely wonderful. I, they have a 50 book limit per semester for grad students and I definitely avail that. Like wherever I lived, I would have just a pile of books from the library that I wouldn't give back until like the absolute end of semester. Um, the studio has restaurants next to it. There are two movie theaters, including the historic Parkway Theater that shows a lot of documentaries and art house films. Um, the Micah Shuttle, uh, service has like the most friendliest of drivers and they're going to make sure that you get home safe which is also very nice for long studio days um the station arts art cafe or snack in the mica building is run by a wonderful couple kevin and bill and they make amazing food and they're going to make sure you're fed um there's a great art supply store right next to the studio it's literally you come up the stairs and it's right there and they give discounts to mica students that's also very useful um the student health services i found to be very wonderful as well um, the counselors there are used to international students and so they know to ask culturally sensitive questions so that they don't assume anything about you. Um, working on a thesis about anxiety can be kind of anxiety inducing, <laughs> as you might be able to imagine. And so it was just nice to be able to have a support system outside of my cohort and outside of my program advisor that I could go to um, to just kind of do some emotional sharing. 
and they will also help you find help off campus if need be. Um, you can also apply for a teaching certification when you're at MICA by teaching three graduate uh, teaching internships that in undergraduate courses and by passing the philosophy and pedagogy course. And this is wonderful because especially when you're doing a practical arts degree, so not a PhD or something that, you know, kind of helps qualify you for a, a career in academia. Um, this helps certifies you and shows that you are qualified to teach art courses at the undergraduate level. So if that's something you're interested in, I would really say that you should uh, look into it. Um, figuring out the stipend versus um, earning money thing, as long as you keep your advisor in the loop. I believe what happened to me was that the appropriate amount of money was then cut from my stipend for the time that I was doing the teaching internship and then Micah would pay me that through checks. Um, so that's how we kind of worked it out. So as long as you keep your advisor in the loop, they're not going to say, no, you shouldn't do this thing that could help your future. They're going to find a way to make it work, which is wonderful. Um, and this is just my desk at the studio where I got to decorate it as chaotically as I wanted. And this is just before we left. So thesis is very much full in swing, which is also explains the mess and all my notes to myself about this page needs this. Um, so when you live in Baltimore, rent isn't very high. Um, I lived on campus, that was definitely more expensive. But then I've, in second year, I found a townhouse uh, with two other ILP friends and the rent was between 500 and 700 each. And my stipend was around between 1700 and $1,800. So this was very doable as far as rent went. And then everything else just went into buying art supplies and food and things like that. Um, Baltimore is a thriving arts and music scene, you know, wonderful museums um, to check out, wonderful bands uh, that do a lot of underground gigs. It's just fun. Um, it also has easy access to New York and DC, which is good. Um, I went to DC for a lot of con for a lot of concerts. Um, and New York, you know, obviously has so much art and culture to offer. So it was nice to be able to just literally hop on a bus and go. Um, I will say halal food can be hard to come by. There's a Punjab grocers near the Johns Hopkins area, but it's about a 20 minute bus ride and I didn't really find meat from there. So I would get like ghee and dal and th those sorts of things. Um, food is relatively inexpensive though, in general. Uh, Lyfts and Ubers are hard to come by. There's no shared options, so they can be expensive. Um, if you do that, if you can find a friend with a car, which I did in second year, which really made my life a lot easier. Um, so one of the biggest things I think that when people hear Baltimore is that they get very concerned about safety. Um, it can be an issue. The area around MICA is generally very safe. I did buy pepper spray just out of precaution. I did not use it, so that's something good. Um, I think the thing with Baltimore, uh, apart from other cities like in New York and DC and the places that I went, it's a lot easier for them to be able to hide people who are unhoused or who are less privileged. In Baltimore, it's very much in your face. Um, I think coming from Pakistan, I was less um, I was less jarred by that than some of my American friends who came from wealthy American cities. And so they felt a bit like, oh, there are people on the street asking for money, which you know is pretty common for us. So I think it's just important to be aware of your surroundings when you're there and to also just kind of be aware of your privilege as a Fulbrighter. Um, to be able to be given this opportunity that is fully funded and to not have to really worry about meals and things like that unless you've really messed up your budgeting for the month. It, it is a privilege. And I think in Baltimore, you really come into contact with people who really don't have half as much as you. And so it's a very humbling experience. And it's good to just keep in mind that even if something slightly untoward happens or something scary is happening on that side of the road, it's it, there's usually a very tragic reason behind it. So. Just keep an open mind and just be kind to people when you can be is something that I was really trying to do when I was there. Um, so post academic life, this is just the last bit. So ever since graduation, I've had speaking engagements with Micah on Orientalism and world building. So going back to my Dastan Amy Tamza project um, and talk, and because I took courses on Orientalism at LUMS, I'm able to talk about this. World building is a, is a good skill to have as an illustrator. And so I've had wonderful sessions with students who ask very intelligent questions about like, oh, what do you do when you are depicting a world that's not of your culture and things. So it's been really fun to kind of do those talks over Zoom at ungodly hours in the middle of the night because it's 4 p.m. there. And for me, it's like 2 a.m. And I'm like, yes, I know academia right now. 
Um, but I've been very honored that I've been that I've had those opportunities. I've also interviewed speculative fiction authors for the Daisy Collective's Writers Block Party. I have been nominated for the ICAT Teaching Fellowship through MICA. Um, they nominated all of their graduate with students who are people of color and who have gotten those teaching certifications. So ICAD is the ability to um, kind of apply for jobs in Canadian and American schools that are part of the ICAD list. And it's for your own field. So it's kind of like the Fulbright in that sense where you upload one set of portfolio, CV and all of this stuff. And then you just apply to all of the schools. Um, you are eligible for nomination for three years after your graduation. So if you don't get it the first time around, you can always tell Micah again, that can you please nominate me again this year? Um, I've also done a lot of freelance projects resulting in published works and physical products. On the right is one of my most favorite projects till now. Um, it's the cover for Osmanth and Meet Malik's debut book, Midnight Door Doorbase, Fables from Pakistan. So all of that stuff that I was saying about representation, speculative fiction, wanting to design books uh, that deal with it, this project really was a dream come true because I got to do exactly that. And Osman's stories are wonderful. And if you can get the book, if you can't just read his stuff online, he's really, really good. Um, I've also set up an online shop to sell prints of my work. I've received a special mention for Karachi's tiny publication grant for my thesis. So they'll help me print it. And it's going to be displayed at the Como Museum in Lahore when COVID lets up a bit. And I've also managed to participate in the digital Lahore Digital Arts Festival. So I've also been published in Illustoria magazine in America. This is a still from my animation for the festival. These are the face masks that I got to make and the pattern reaction piece that I showed you all earlier, the t-shirt with the robots on it, it directly led me to this project because someone shared a picture of that work and and that's just a mock-up. That's just a school assignment that I did. And they said, we really love this. Can you make face masks for us? Um, that are also patterns. So that was really exciting that a school assignment could get me a paid gig also. Um, I also really got interested into printmaking when I was at MICA. So on the left is one of my most favorite um, lino cut pieces that I made. And on the right is my most recent project, which is just this embroidery piece that I did for fun. It took about three weeks. It was very intense, but I enjoyed every minute of it. And it's just, so I'm showing you all of these just to show that my practice is still evolving. Um, and it's very much because of this degree that I've been able to learn printmaking, embroidery, um, how to make comics. Uh, so a lot of the things that I'm doing now are kind of directly, they are directly as a result of this degree. And of just having this exposure, say, as opposed to if I had just gone to a place that only focused on comics, which is what I initially thought that I wanted to do. Um, yeah, so thank you. That was just my experience at MICA.